feature presentation. Well, welcome back to another Untitled Movie Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Matt Robeck. <laughs> Alongside, <laughs> he's allergic to tomatoes, but he's tomato meter approved, Eric Marchin. Matt, ever since I can remember, I've wanted to ride my bicycle. Ah, uh, yes. Today we are reviewing Jeff Nichols' The Bike Riders, or The Accents, the movie. I uh, I already introduced myself, but Eric, how are you? Uh, Matt, I'm I'm good. I, I see the uh, I forgot because I did the characters I, yeah. have affected you. Uh, yeah. quite a I got bit. lost in the character. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're was going it? method that was there. My, that was my best Jodie Comer. Yeah. Oh, I thought that was Tom Hardy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there's some accents in this movie, guys. We're, I can't wait to talk about it. Uh, Eric, how are you doing? Man, I'm good. I'm good. We just finished recording our Inside Out 2 review, so I've dated this episode already. Um, I mean, you guys can go listen to that right now, yeah. You know, we we saw uh, the bike riders earlier this morning, and now we are talking about it. It's a film <laughs> that I think almost has a more interesting life outside of the discussion of the movie in terms of how it was handled by uh, Fox and then eventually moved over to focus features. And, you know, when you're watching this movie, you know, I, I made the reference there in terms of uh, uh, Goodfellas, you know, that will be the sure, main yeah. sort of stylistic and narrative um, critical analysis of the film that the structure of it is very similar to Goodfellas where you have the framing device of an interview or series of interviews by uh, Danny Lyon who would go on to produce a book based on uh, this real life club um, this motorbike uh, club uh, the Vandals in Chicago and so you know, at first you're you're looking at it mainly from the perspective of Kathy's point of view, who's played by Jodie Comer. That Matt beautifully, you know, yes, if you you're if you're it. watching you this on YouTube, you, you'll 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 think to yourself, "Is is Jodie Comer in the room with you?" Um, and this sort of legacy of bike riders, specifically focusing on um, this group in Chicago from the mid 1960s into the early 1970s. And we see the ups and downs and the creation of this group that starts off almost as though you mentioned this. And I think it was a perfect uh, comparison uh, as being the cosplay version of. Yeah. Writers. It's, it's LARPing. <laughs> like, and I meant that as an insult. I don't want to insult any biker gangs, but it's just, and, and we'll get into a little bit of how that sort of works uh, for this movie but as i was watching it i'm like oh yeah being in a biker gang is just like live action role play <laughs> like it's like larping and i know it's you're living a life it's a it's a life it's your personality sometimes but sometimes it's it, it, the, even the way the movie shows it sometimes these are like family men and, and different things like that and they just want you know it's like someone doing a dungeons and dragons game every week with their buddies to me <laughs> like it's just yeah. like you you need a group of guys you get together and you like pretend to do something and yeah it's sometimes that pretend can turn into real things bad or good um but in the end it just seems like a bunch of guys playing you know a role some people are you know i feel like more authentic than others when it comes to being in a biker gang or or, or being in a motorcycle club but uh ultimately it's 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 this sounds derogatory and I don't know if it is, but it, it's dorky just like a fantasy football would be or, or like Dungeons and Dragons. And again, dorky shit. I love doing board games or whatever. And yeah, sure. Sometimes you're, you're beating the shit out of someone or stabbing someone or lighting a bar on fire. But ultimately it just feels like playing pretend. And I think I'm just going to jump into my thoughts in the movie. Yeah. I think that yes, that's the characters, but I also felt that, watching this as well where i like jeff nichols i think this is his most accessible and conventional uh, movie that he's made um and for that i'm kind of just very medium to negative on it where it just really didn't do anything for me um the accents are distracting i thought it was you know jeff nichols always has a methodical kind of slower pace to his movies but when it 
it's weird and kind of interesting or has sci-fi elements or, uh, you know, uh, I, I can get more invested into it where this just felt like, you know, art house sons of anarchy, but not even <laughs> like, not even like art house in like a weird or interesting way. But like we were talking after the movie of like what your dad would think art house movies are or whatever, right? Like, yeah. oh, it's a little slower. It's, you know, things like that. But um, so I just kind of felt nothing watching it. And I, I, I really was distracted by the accents. And that goes back to the point that I was just saying of like, it just felt like people playing pretend. I never bought into it, right? Like when you start with Jodie Comer doing this like really thick, absurd sounding accent and don't get me wrong i'm sure she listened to the recordings from this guy who wrote this book and sh that character probably sounds exactly like that but i don't know what the fuck that person sounds like you could have done anything and i would have believed you and so when you sound like i'm watching a coen brothers movie that takes place in fargo or I'm an like, snl sketch uh, yeah or an sketch. snl sketch like it it really it's not a comedy it's not funny at all like at any moment so when you have these people doing you know you have really the kings and queens of accents in this movie so i understand why they all signed up to do it you have tom hardy and austin butler who love an accent i'm surprised joseph gordon levitt wasn't in there somewhere doing something but like but doing a french I, accent yeah for no reason um so I don't know, like watching it and making that LARPing kind of comparison to, you know, a, a motorcycle club in real life, but then having like these actors play these characters, I just never bought it and I never got invested to anything that was happening. So it kind of just went through the motions um, and played out like it's not bad. Jeff Nichols is a good filmmaker. Um but it, it just felt like archaic to me in the in the way, you know, I say archaic and it feels weird to say that this feels like a movie that was 10, 15 years ago. But that means it would have come out in 2012 or something like that. Um, but it you're talking like about something... the time when like because, you know, again, going back to the story, this takes place in, in the 60s yeah. and 70s. It feels like it's both trying to mimic those films that it's sure. emulating, like, you know, the easy riders, the wild ones, things like yeah, that. Yeah, a little bit, but it feels like it was something that's mimicking that 10 years ago. Does that make sense? Like, well, it's no I wild hogs, at, what, but what yeah, is, I, I would have watched it at, <laughs> I said this, like, it feels like one of those festival movies and it did play some festivals last, last fall, but, um, that I would have seen release. Yeah. Like I would have seen at TIFF cause it's got big names in it. Jeff Nichols likes to show up at film festivals and, um, and I would have watched it and I would have been like, eh, okay. And then I would have forgotten about it and I'm having the same feeling now. And I guess it's just a movie, but it feels like that, you know, I don't know. It seems like something, yeah, maybe your dad would throw on like on a Sunday afternoon and he watched it on, crave here in canada or something and you're like he's like hey so that bike riders movie is pretty good and i'd be like yeah dad cool man um so i don't know that sounds really negative again um but i just uh really was so medium on it it, it hurts but eric what about you yeah uh, i'm i'm mixed on it as well and also a little disappointed just because i think jeff nichols is one of the great american filmmakers you, you know you look at movies like take shelter and midnight special and you know loving and and he's one of those guys that is very sensitive and nuanced in how he approaches his material as both a writer and director and usually doesn't go with cliches and tropes and finds ways to kind of strip what you're expecting from certain movies, whether they be genre films or dramas. And here it felt like he was going for those conventions in order to be a little bit more accessible while still trying to parse through some of those cliches or the heightened drama to the point where you have two movies in a way you you have the restrained kind of quiet moments in the movie that you know if you if you've seen jeff nichols films you'll recognize that here but then because the performances are so 
specific in terms of you know bordering on caricature at times that the movie i think the direction needs to match that and that's why something like goodfellas i think works so well is because the filmmaking is on the same wavelength and frequency of you know ray liotta's performance and and looking and, and looking at the highs and lows of a character you know coming in this is you know pretty much middle of the road throughout the entire film where it plays it in kind of one lane and even the bigger moments that happen in the movie yeah. and, and the violence kind of feel like it it's all simmering and it never explodes and then you know the quieter moments never resonate in the way that they're expected to because you have the kind of artifice of the performance not maybe matching even though I don't think anybody is necessarily awful in the film. I'm I still do not get Austin Butler as a leading man. Like he's not necessarily bad in this film. He's just kind of bland. Um where Jody Comer and Tom Hardy and you know even a lot of these smaller supporting actors, you know, you'll see someone like Paul Sparks pop up or you know obviously Jeff Nichols Muse who I think is the legitimate guy who can pull off a tough guy role in michael shannon uh yeah. is, is very believable and has the best speech in 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 the film and talking about you know not even being good enough and rejected by um the u.s army and and not being able to be drafted into the vietnam war and i, I think that that is a crucial aspect of this narrative because you have this old guard that starts this club and a lot of those guys grew up with you know, fathers and and family that fought in World War II, and they were waiting for their time to, you know, go to war or, you know, become a man, that kind of machismo element of the storytelling. And it never happened for them. And so, you know, there's a scene in the film where Tom Hardy's Johnny is watching The Wild Ones, and the clip that they use is the scene where Brando's character is asked, what are you rebelling against and he responds with what do you have and it feels like it's a generation of of wayward souls that were looking to fit into the society in a post-world war ii world but weren't able to and then were waiting for their moment that never came in terms of building character and building themselves to be you know these aggressive guys and so instead they you know find this kind of unity in starting clubs like this and expanding them but then you have the vietnam war come into play and a lot of the guys that you know go and come back are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and you know are 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 more on the fringes and you know the the older crew doesn't know how to respond or relate to those things and yeah i really appreciated that aspect of it and there are little moments throughout the film where you know, there's a conversation between Comer and Hardy, if you can get past the accents, where it does feel like the the whole message of this story is summed up kind of really beautifully in a way that I think Jeff Nichols filmmaking is. And even just being a filmmaker or creative in general or, or somebody that is trying to do something, you know, you put your heart and soul into something you're passionate about, but then over time, it just becomes something else and 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 at one point or another you just have to accept it and it might disappoint you or it might not be what you were expecting it to be and it gets out of hand or it just is not what you intended it to be and unfortunately you just have to move on and sometimes it will reject you in the end and that's the most tragic part of i think loving being a filmmaker in the way that these characters love being in this gang, but seeing how the club morphs, you know, over the decade and, and over, you know, th- this period. And, and even, you know, the, the first sequence of the film and, and the, and the sequence that we come back to of the burning down of the bar, I think shows you that it's like, okay, there's no turning back for this group now in terms of what they're doing. And, you know, it gets out of hand and we see how characters are affected throughout. And yeah, there's just a really like a lot, like I I look at this movie and there's just a lot of really great character actors. And, you know, I mentioned Scorsese, there's a great nod to Barry Lyndon in the square fight sequence in one scene. Um, 
you know, there are elements here that feel like, okay, if this was made in the seventies or eighties, someone like maybe Walter Hill would have directed it. Or, you know, like part of me feels like is, was Jeff Nichols the right guy to do it? Because it's not a bad looking movie, but it still is very kind of plain overall. But I, I look at someone like Anton Corbin, who has a photography background and, you know, this being the, 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 the book that, that Dan, Danny Lyons, uh, you know, wrote and, and, and put together was the inspiration and maybe somebody that has a more visually specific style that maybe is um, sort of extravagant, but also kind of aggressive because Nichols isn't yeah. that kind of filmmaker. He's, he's very, he's not hands off, but he is a guy that I think like someone like Richard Linklater that you can take him for granted in terms of, Oh, well, he's not doing much, you know, but he is. It but almost it's a feels effortless, style for kind this. of like a, yeah. yeah, a chill vibe or like you said, um, emotional or something like that. But I don't get that here. It, yeah, I, I, it's a weird one. Like uh, we, we both mentioned, like I like Boyd Holbrook a lot. Um, I like who should have been in the, uh, in, in the Austin Butler yeah, role. I, I completely agree with that, um, you know, but hot actor of the minute you gotta throw him in everything and it, it gets a little bit you know kind of stale he looks like he's auditioning he's for an h&m line of yeah dirty boy motorcycle ads and yeah. like the way he poses it doesn't feel like again it's going back to like the actors playing the part or you know yeah. um dressing Being up posers, and, and yeah, yeah and, and, and and it works in terms of tom hardy's character in where he starts and where he progresses yes, where he with- starts as a family man and, and needs something more. So he starts this motorcycle club. So he's always been a little bit of a poser or trying to kind of, you know, he sees it in a movie and he wants to emulate that in, in real life where the Butler character, uh, Benny is supposed to be this like, Oh, I don't give a shit about anything like a natural kind of perfect fit for the, for the for the club and stuff like that but it it never feels effortless like something about he's Butler, like vin diesel like, always, weirdly yeah yeah like, like everything yeah and that's i think my biggest issue with a lot of it like the ta- like the johnny character that makes sense jody comer's kathy like again like i said at the beginning like i'm sure that's what she sounded like but i just think you could have toned it down maybe a little bit and i think her scenes with Mike Feist's character, which is funny seeing him in such a small role when he was so great in challengers too, but well, this is um, like challengers though, in a way, right? Because you have Tom Hardy and uh, Jodie Comer fighting over Austin Butler. Yeah. Very different, but yes. Um, And I agree with you with Shannon and, you know, Norman Reedus. Yeah, that makes sense. Doesn't he have a motorcycle show Um, and things like that? Damon Heron is is good, too, I think. Yeah, Yeah, Like, he's one of those guys that I think is weirdly underrated and, like, can play, obviously, you know, and and I don't mean this in in terms of objectifying him in any way, but he has a kind of, like scuzzy rat kind of look but here is like great character in, actor he's a yeah but in, in the second actor. in command he's not completely like a vile horrible person you no, know no. where you look at like his role as charles manson in both once upon a time in hollywood and mind hunters it's like okay right. the guy can play that role <laughs> yeah. really well but here he's not necessarily like a scumbag he's just somebody that kind of is like almost you know, the, the stability in the group, the guy that you kind of take for granted, that's keeping everything kind of running behind the scenes. Yeah. Again, he does feel effortless. There are some people there where you're like, Oh, that, that fits. I just think it's the main cast, whether they're miscast or just it's the direction of their characters or, or whatever that I just, it, it it does border on sketch sometimes where, um, and I don't, it's not that the, you know, biker gang kind of show or movie is oversaturated because I just think of sons of anarchy and that was a while ago and that's your more populist kind of, um, also know, another bland white guy, this. Charlie Hunnam. <laughs> right. But fit that, like I bought yeah. Charlie Hunnam more than I do Butler, right? Like I, maybe cause I wasn't super familiar with Charlie Hunnam before that show. Um, 
but even someone like Ron Perlman felt oh, he, so perfect for yeah. that, right? Like him that and Michael felt, Shannon hanging out, uh, I would buy that a hundred percent. Shannon feels like he would fit into that show too, right? Like he's yeah. the guy who you could pull from this show, put him in that. I'm not saying Sons of Anarchy is the most authentic version of a biker gang. I have no fucking idea what I'm talking about, but I just. Uh, yeah, it just something about the main cast in this movie that just like never clicked with me. And it was everything I worried about it being like, oh, the accents and this and, and, and stuff like that. And then to your point about Goodfellas, um, yeah, there was a kinetic energy to the direction of that movie that is missing here. And I agree with you that maybe it's not, um, you know, maybe Nichols, as much as he wanted to do this, wasn't his style just didn't vibe with what he was trying to get across in the movie. And yeah, the, the emotional beats didn't quite hit the violence um, and, and intense moments felt almost nonchalant, which is a Jeff Nichols thing too. But like sometimes those tender moments, that's the word I was looking for worked in his other mil- films, but here they're not necessarily any tenderness. I guess at times you could maybe argue that, but like, that kind of vibe just, I I don't know, didn't really fit what was happening on screen. So it ended up making me feel nothing. And then it just, again, kind of plays out not bad, you know, well-made enough actors are definitely acting with a capital A or in all capitals, but a capital um, accent. (laughs) Yeah, there you go. Um, But yeah, I don't really have like all that much more to say about it. Like it, it, I don't know. It's not really an awards play, even though they might've thought that at first, like, I don't know commercially if it's really, you know, I I guess it has that niche kind of adult, you know, mid budget movie that we don't get a lot of anymore. So like, I especially theatrically. Yeah. So like, I, I guess that's great, but I don't see this. I just I struggled to see like who is this for, and I I made a joke about being a dad movie or um, things like that, but I, I don't know. So um, well, even that's yeah. the problem, right? Because I feel like if you recommend it to the art house crowd based on Jeff Nichols, they'll reject it because it's too plain or accessible or conventional but then if you recommend it to the dads they might look at some scenes where there's no music and and there's just a conversation between characters or the the how nonchalant some of the uh, violence and yeah or the the slowed down nature of you know characters just sitting and having a picnic you know things like that where that might be a bit of a turnoff you know that if they're expecting that if they're expecting of, sons of anarchy or something too, or right? goodfellas and and i think yeah, like that's goodfellas, the other yeah. goodfellas sort of marker here is that goodfellas is a movie that i can rewatch any time and like even talking about it now it's like oh i could just throw that on and have it play in the background and you know hang out with it where this i don't feel that like i don't think I'll ever rewatch this movie unless, you know, down the line I'm doing a Jeff Nichols retrospect or something like that. It doesn't have that rewatchability factor to it where it's like right after watching it, you want to throw it on again, where when we saw challengers, it was like, I could watch that right away and, and start that again from the beginning. And so that also I think goes against its commercial commercial viability and you know it's it's such a weird kind of middle ground film that there are moments i do really appreciate and there's a lot of character actors i like in this and and you know it 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 just kind of feels like it's there and it's unfortunate that this is the first jeff nichols movie we've gotten in in nearly a decade yeah like you know, seven eight nine years what, what yeah because loving was the last film that he directed and, and he had been two in the same year with midnight special midnight special and and loving right yeah, yeah. and so, so it's been a while and you know like y- you always are excited when somebody that you respect comes back and you know he's working right now on developing two of cormac mccarthy's uh final novels and i hope that'll work out and and like i'm always excited for him and 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 he's you know i i had a chance to talk to him once and he seems like a relatively down-to-earth kind of guy and and so you always root for him but i think his strengths weirdly are on character studies that are intimate and he can still do genre like mud and and 
take shelter are two movies that play in you know psychological horror with with take shelter and and mud almost has like a fantasy fairy tale mm-hmm. perspective from the kid's point of view but what's great about both of those movies is that he grounds those stories in human behavior and yeah you know you care about the characters or you worry about the characters here you're just kind of put at a distance with the performances even though i i, I liked tom hardy in the movie and i'll take this over the venom movies i agree any yeah. day of the week but it does feel performative in that way where it's like look at us act we're acting you know and that's a personal thing for me too like i don't love acting with a capital a like i i want to be you know i it is escapism for me but once i start to like see like through the looking glass and like no like i need to be like i i need to buy in and certain movie stars brings that out right like but i think once you're such a big movie star and you can just make me go okay you're this character and you're not tom cruise you're not xyz um that's when you're really really good at what you do and there are certain people where when you see them you just you're like oh you got to work a little harder uh but butler's getting to that point just because i've seen so much of him and i think tom hardy just with the, the accents and stuff it just stands out a little bit more so um i think that's where that comes from but yeah that's a personal thing with me it's just like when it almost feels like stage acting you know what i mean yeah. like that's when you have to overperform because you need to hit the people in the back like it's just that works there but when i see it in in film i i don't know i need it to be believable and maybe if i went and if they're those audio recordings are accessible maybe that's maybe that would help but again i don't know what these people sound like or, or look like but and i'm um, sure they do have like you 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 listen to accents and, and dialects and and you know there are truths in certain stereotypes or caricatures and things like that but there yeah. is that movie quality that you're mentioning where it's so theatrical at times that you know it it takes almost as much time adjusting to Kathy and Johnny and Benny in terms of just how, you know, the actors are portraying them to getting used to the world and the structure Mm -hmm. and finding interesting little moments that you can kind of gravitate towards because, you know, it can keep you at a remove. and, and, And I feel like there are, some genuinely good moments here, but it can be so hard to get to them because you're fighting through either laughter. And you know that like a lot of these actors are, are good. And like, even, you know, seeing like some of the smaller roles being filled out by like, you know, Carl Glausman, who we just saw in a very small role as well in um, civil war. He was the, the spotter uh, in civil war in the, in the sniper one uh, winter wonderland sequence. And, and here he's playing uh, the, the one guy who uh, has the bandana and kind of like the, yeah, the, the yeah up hair. And so like, there's a lot of people that like, if you are entrenched in the world of movies, whether they be big movie stars or, you know, smaller character actors, you'll recognize a lot of people in this film. And sometimes, you know, they're better at sort of, you know, integrating themselves into the role than others. And then when you see someone wearing, you know, the well-worn jackets and stuff like that, like a Austin Butler, you don't feel like it's real. You just feel like he's a very contemporary actor in, you know, this moment. And obviously, you know, we're saying this now and, and people will be like, Oh, well, what about, you know, once upon a time in Hollywood? And it's like, yeah, no, I, I get that, but it's such a small role. And maybe it was also because it was at mm-hmm. a time where we weren't as familiar with Austin Butler as we are now. And also, you know, if you don't like Austin Butler, you will kind of enjoy um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood even more. Uh, but yeah, it just it, it feels like there's a little bit of overexposure there. And like if you're going for accentuated performances, you need to cast you know, more character actors in the lead roles than in like the movie stars, but then you wouldn't have the movie made, right? Like if you didn't have a Tom Hardy or Austin Butler yeah. or someone like that in the role, for sure, you need the, the cachet to get financing. That's a great point. And so I definitely understand. I just, uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to give the movie a 2.5. Didn't really 
work for me. I think it's okay, but I'm I'm mixed negative on this one where I don't think I'd ever want to watch it again. I wouldn't really suggest it to many people. Um, it's not horrible. It's just it, it kind of came and went, um, and I don't really have much else to say. 2.5 out of 5 for me. I'm going to give it a 3 out of 5 just because, you know, I, I still think there's you know, moments in the film. Uh, I, I think, you know, the soundtrack is also good. I, I really love the song yeah. uh, road runner by Bo Diddley. Um, it's, it's a very <laughs> minor pass, but it's one of those things where, you know, looking back at it, you'll, you'll forget this movie even came out this year by the time we get to December. Exactly. I think that's it. And, and it's not that it doesn't do, I, I agree with you. I like the generational kind of, again, the, the, the new kids coming up and and how they act differently and and that kind of juxtaposition and things like that i don't love how that one character is written that's all i'll say about that like i just shit like that i I know you have to kind of i just i don't know well did you recognize so one of the characters toby wallace who's kind of like the villain in the film yeah his dad (laughs) his dad i was like who the fuck is this guy i've seen him from somewhere it's like it's a really quick scene it's yeah. basically like domestic violence and, and what have you but i was like okay where have i seen it so i had to look him up afterwards the, the actor's name is paul Dillon, and he played the irish villain in austin powers the guy with the lucky charms <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> And I that's couldn't really stop funny. laughing after I knew that. And it's yeah. like, that's an intense scene and you're not. So, and I was just like, oh, yeah. my God, that's how you could think of. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you all for listening. We really, really do appreciate it. We have a review for Inside Out 2 up right now that you guys can check out. Uh, amongst other things, please go back and check everything out uh, on the Untitled Movie Podcast feed as well as on Letterboxd, which is untitled underscore movies. And we'll also have a review for Yorgos Lanthimos's Kinds of Kindness, which uh, should be out soon for you guys. I had schedules mixed up in my head, but it should be out quite soon. I think by the 21st, probably on release day or something like that, the limited release day. We'll put that out there. So uh, stay tuned for that. Very excited to check that one out. So um, uh, stay tuned for that. Oh, are you going to mention where you can find uh, everything on the social media? Didn't medias? I say? Well, oh, yeah. And then you can follow me on all social yeah. medias at Matt Rohrbeck. I, see, I'm, I'm losing it, Eric. Losing it. Yeah. And you should. You should follow Matt. He's 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 a good guy. Yeah. He knows his stuff. He he loves yeah. movies. He's he's Your editing likes are hidden storm. on Twitter now. So like all my tweets. No one can see that you yeah. like them. <laughs> there will be no shame. Uh, you can find more of my video reviews on rogerstv.com slash cinema scene and on all the social medias at EM6211. And if you have a chance, you know, um, write us a review, give us five stars, let us know what you think. Tell us that we're great. We need love. Until next time. No, 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 no. No, yeah. no, no. <laughs> God. Bye, everybody.